All right, uh, we're going to talk obstetrics here, and there will be some obstetric questions on the general board, and I'm going to try and emphasize those points you need to get all of those questions right. All right, so let's, let's see if we can do that. How many of you see patients on occasion that happen to be pregnant? Yeah, that's a lot of you, so you should pay attention to some of this, right? How many of you actually do prenatal care? Oh, good, this is a little better than I've seen in some other groups. And then how many of you are still getting up in the middle of the night, going into the hospital and delivering babies? Yeah, there's, oh, that's actually encouraging as well. So, and are you intending on taking the OB module on the board if you do OB? Maybe, huh? Not quite sure yet. The, I think the materials that I give you for the OB lectures would prepare you well for that module. So here are some things that if you're in an urgent care center and someone comes to you who happens to be pregnant that you should be aware of. The obstetricians in the room are very aware of these, but you know, she's coming in and she's got maybe tachycardia. Her heart rate is a little bit elevated. That's normal. Um, the heart may be a little bit displaced. All of, that cart, all of this is to aim to get blood flow to the uterus and to help the baby grow. Um, so 30% of the cardiac output at term is actually directed to the uterus. She may have an increased respiratory rate, and then um, if you're checking labs, you, you may see that there is a corresponding respiratory alkalosis if you needed to look for that. Most of the time, we're not doing that, but these are the normal physiologic changes to get oxygenation to the baby. Okay, the, ba the, the baby, the way to think about the baby and hemoglobin is it's a parasite. Okay, now mom may or may not name her child Nercator americanus when it's born, but it, is a, it can cause iron deficiency in moms. And so the reality is, is her hemoglobin is typically going to drop as she progresses in pregnancy because the baby is the one getting most of the iron. And sometimes we actually have to supplement our patients during pregnancy with ferrous sulfate or ferrous gluconate because most prenatal vitamins contain inadequate iron to actually treat anemia when it's occurring. And there are these bi-trimester guidelines that we use to determine when we should supplement iron. If I'm in the urgent care and I'm doing some labs, I might notice that the white blood cell is elevated. Mild elevations are normal in pregnancy. Mild elevations of alpha are normal in pregnancy. They do, not, they do not show pathology in a pregnant patient. The GI tone is going to be decreased, so constipation is very common. Acid reflux is very common. And these are the things that patients are, may be complaining to you about. Weight gain in pregnancy. A lot of uh, energy around this right now because if we can prevent excessive weight gain in pregnancy, we can actually reduce the risk of primary C-section. So we are counseling patients very carefully in the office about their weight gain. And, and if you add it all up, you know, the, the fetus, the placenta, and the amniotic fluid, you know, you're looking at about 10, maybe 11 pounds there, all right? So if she's gaining a whole lot more beyond that, it's really not the baby. Most patients can gain about 20 to 25 pounds, and that's okay, but if she gains more than 25 pounds, basically it's primarily fat. And if she's getting fat as a result of this, baby gets fat as a result of this. And fat babies sometimes don't come through the chute very well. So here are some guidelines from the Institute of Medicine that uh, say here's what the weight gain uh, should be in somebody depending on their BMI. So if they're really underweight, we let them gain more. That's a no-brainer. And if they're overweight, we say gain uh, far less. And if they're really morbidly obese, we really are trying to keep their weight gain to a minimum, more close to that 11 to 12 pounds, trying to keep it down there. It, just like you're counseling your patient about what is good weight loss when they're exercising and intentionally trying to lose weight. Pregnancy is not that time to try to lose weight. But if we tell patients, you know, weight loss on, a, on the order of a half a pound to a pound per week, all right? So normal weight gain in pregnancy should not exceed a half a pound to a pound per week 
once you're out of the first trimester. If she's gaining a pound a week in the first trimester, that is a, you know, there's something more going on driving that eating than the fact that she's got a parasite, okay? So you got to talk to her about her nutrition. Um, and then, you know, weight gain less than two or over 6.5 in one month when you're seeing her routinely in the office really warrants a review of the eating habits to find the etiology. I'm always surprised to find that lots of uh, young patients like to have cocoa puffs with chocolate milk for breakfast, you know. It's just like the nutrition is not very good. Review, maybe refer to a nutritional counselor. Why? Because getting back to that pre-pregnancy weight is hard, okay? It really is hard. I was a thin, felt thing before I had my one child. Not really. But the reality is, is I gained probably 40 pounds with, the, uh, with my son. And the reality is, it's harder to lose that weight long term. And if I had gotten pregnant again right away and gained more weight, then I'd have a harder time. And so women you know, can gain a significant amount of weight during their childbearing age just because they're having difficulty losing it. And so, you know, what are some risk factors for retention of that postpartum weight? Um, these are, you know, just statistical things, African-American race, pre-pregnancy obesity, quitting smoking. We're not going to tell her to take up smoking to lose weight, but if she quits smoking, that may make it more difficult for her to um, lose that weight. Here's the nutrition. It sort of reiterates the bit about iron. Um, for most patients, the amount that's in prenatal vitamins is sufficient. Uh, in Michigan, we have certain lakes that you really shouldn't be eating fish from because of the bioamplification of the mercury and the things that are um, polluting our lakes. And so you, if you're providing prenatal care, you may need to know what your local guidelines are on the consumption of fish. And then caffeine, we generally recommend that they de uh, limit to less than 200 milligrams per day because they may be at increased risk for miscarriage and stillbirth with higher intakes. Folic acid, most prenatal vitamins have somewhere between 800 and 1,000 milligrams per day of, prenatal, of uh, folic acid. These really ought to be called preconception vitamins because she really needs to be on them three months prior to conceiving in order to uh, have adequate folic acid stores to prevent neural tube defects. And this is now a level A recommendation by the U.S. Prevention Task Force that when a woman of reproductive age comes into your office, if she's in those reproductive years, you should either talk to her about prenatal vitamins or talk to her about contraception, because she either wants to get pregnant or she doesn't, and you should you know, treat her with prenatal vitamins if she is not currently desiring to be pregnant. Um, certain populations need a lot more folic acid than is in prenatal vitamins. Um, if, the baby, if she had a baby with a prior neural tube defect, she needs four milligrams per day. That's 4,000 micrograms per day. If she's on certain older anti-seizure medications, she needs additional folic acid. Hispanic patients, they think it's a dietary issue that they may lack. Um, so if they're eating a traditional Hispanic diet, they may lack sufficient folic acid. And diabetes, a patient with diabetes needs more folic acid preconceptually than does a patient who does not. How about air travel? Most airlines will allow air travel up to about four weeks. Why is that? Well, you're, you know, one could say, hey, maybe it's barrel pressure changes in the, air, air, um, in the actual airplane, but I, it's probably more practical than that. They really don't, it's hard to get the food cart down the aisle when there's somebody delivering in it, okay? And so the reality is that's probably why the airlines really do restrict travel. The other thing is any lengthy trip, whether it's by air, ship, you know, plane, sea, whatever. If she's sitting for long, prolonged periods of time, she has an increased risk of DVT. So you want her to get up and move around, you know, hopefully at two hour intervals, if uh, possible. When, when she's in the office, really at the first prenatal visit, we need to talk to her about breastfeeding. Because actually, if we start talking at that first prenatal visit, there's a higher likelihood that she'll actually breastfeed her babies. Very few 
contraindications. The one that they usually nail you or put out there on the board is HIV infection. You know, that's the one they want you to know. That's a contraindication to breastfeeding. She can exercise during pregnancy. However, this is not the time to take up extreme sports, okay? It's not the time to do snowboarding or become a trampoline um, aficionado. Hot tubs, saunas, increasing her core temperature may increase the risk of neural tube defects and miscarriage. So we want to advise women in the first trimester not to avoid getting into hot tubs for prolonged periods of time. Um, medications, very few have been proven to be safe. The old A, B, C, D, X is gone. Now you have to look at each and every drug individually, counsel patients, make sure that they understand the risk and the benefit of their medication. Sex, uh, well, it got her in the pregnant to begin with, right? And couples, these are young couples who probably still love each other and want to have sex when they're pregnant. There's only one contraindication to having sex when you're pregnant, and that's if there's a placenta previa. If there's a placenta previa, anything in the vagina could cause that placenta that's right over the cervical os to bleed. Substance abuse, alcohol, marijuana, tobacco, no amount safe. A new paper by ACOG says we're not doing a very good job about talking to women about marijuana use in pregnancy. We really ought to do that. The neonatal literature says, you know, there's probably, well, there are developmental problems. ADHD is higher in babies that were born to mothers who used marijuana during their pregnancy. So, you know, we want to counsel and ask about that. Immunizations, no live vaccines. Now, you can strike off the influenza because we're not using a live vaccine anymore, but you cannot give varicella or rubella uh, live vaccines to pregnant women. Um, influenza vaccine, the intramuscular vaccine, is recommended for all pregnant women. Now, there's been a little controversy. One small study said maybe increases the risk of miscarriage in first trimester. ACOG says give the influenza vaccine. So they don't, regardless of trimester, if you're really concerned, and most of these patients, when you see them in the office, they're already 10 or 12 weeks pregnant anyhow. You know, so uh, you can go ahead and give that influenza vaccine. Tdap, this is one you gotta know, that and the influenza, you gotta know all pregnant women recommend influenza, but Tdap in every single pregnancy. So I've actually had a patient who had two pregnancies less than a year apart, and she got two Tdaps. And the reason for that is that you want mom's antibody response to come up for those, those pertussis antibodies, and then she passes them to the baby. Same with influenza. It's the only protection we have for babies before they start receiving their own Tdap vaccines. And it's the only protection we have for babies for influenza vaccine because those kids don't get their first influenza vaccine until they're six months of age. Um, if she happened to be getting her HPV vaccine and then found out she was pregnant, you can reassure her that, you know, it's, it's safe. You're not going to give her her next HPV vaccine right away while she's pregnant, but you can tell her it's okay. And other vaccines can be given as, way, as well. So when we see patients who are actually planning their pregnancy in advance, they come in, we want to basically make sure we optimize the treatment of any underlying condition like diabetes or hypertension. We're going to assess for genetic risk. We offer cystic fibrosis screening to mom, and then we update any immunizations that we can do prior to her conceiving and make sure she's on prenatal vitamins. At that preconception visit, this is before she's become pregnant, we could also test for HIV and know about it then, and then talk to her about environmental toxins, including tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana. Then when she comes to us for that initial prenatal evaluation, a lot of times this is done by a nurse in her office. She's taking the comprehensive history before they actually get to me for the actual exam. We're going to ask questions about how supported is this pregnancy. Are you a Jehovah's Witness? Because maybe she doesn't want a blood transfusion should it be necessary. Has she had a prior premature birth? Has she had a baby 
that was infected with group B strep. If she's had a baby infected with group B strep, you're done. This pregnancy is going to be treated as though she had group B strep. Um, it, what are the birth weights? What kind of complications? Was, was it an operative vaginal delivery or was it just a spontaneous vaginal delivery? And then other um, pieces of family medical history and then thinking about the genetic outcomes of prior pregnancies. In addition, screen these women for exposure to domestic violence. And that is sometimes they want to, these questions show up on the board, not infrequently because domestic violence sadly increases during pregnancy. And then when they get to me, my whole effort is about figuring out how far along this is. How far along is the pregnancy? Now, if she has the Ant Flow app, and she can tell me exactly when her last period was, and exactly, it was a normal period for her, and she can tell me, I think I conceived on this date, I've got pretty gut darn good history. But a lot of women don't you know, have that real clear history, and so I may need to get an ultrasound, early ultrasound, to date the pregnancy. Um, I'm going to measure her, you know, in the office. I'm going to do my, what I call fruit of the womb when I do a bimanual exam, and I'm going to estimate the size of that uterus based on fruit sizes and decide, well, is she a cantaloupe? Is that more like 14 weeks? Or is she really just a nice little uh, navel orange? Is that around 8 to 10 weeks? For the guys, in the room, you can do sports analogies. You can figure out whether it's the size of a, you know, a soccer ball or a softball or a hardball. Ultrasound, though, is very, very useful if there's any question in my mind as to how far along this pregnancy may be or if her period was abnormal. So any question, we just reflexively are getting transvaginal ultrasounds because we really need to date pregnancies well because of the, the things that happen along the way where we might have to induce a pregnancy. If she says, I don't know, comes to you greater than 22 weeks pregnant, that's suboptimally um, dated and she'll need a repeat ultrasound for interval growth so that you can make sure, try and nail it as, as, as well as you can over time. So this is just a nice guideline that tells you, you know, how many days discrepancy you're allowed between the certain, certain LMP, somebody who really knows when their LMP was, and um, the uh, uh, baby size. And if that discrepancy is greater than five days on, a pre on an ultrasound that's less than eight, uh, nine weeks, you're going to use the ultrasound dating. And those are all the measurements that are done, crown rump length, Transvaginal ultrasound is preferred. Bio, uh, bipyramidal diameter head circumference, a abdominal circumference, and femur length. And as you get further along, you know that femur length is good. I've started to see some radial lengths on ultrasounds. I, I have not reviewed that literature to know how valid a radial, uh, or I'm sorry, a humerus length is in terms of dating the pregnancy. So here's a 21-year-old woman who comes in for routine low risk. That's the key, low risk prenatal care. Which of the following tests are routinely recommended? How many want to vote A, B, C, D? The Ds have it. Routine HIV testing for all pregnant women. Now, if she's high risk, it, maybe I'm looking at a hep C. If she's a th thyroid patient, I'm getting a TSH. And then it's not rubeola immunity, it's rubella immunity we're looking for. So here are all the routine labs, and they're the same routine labs that you did when you were a resident all those many years ago, all right? Checking to make sure she's not anemic, assess the mean cell volume. Um, we're checking for immunity to rubella. A lot, now there's a recommendation to check for immunity to varicella. We're not going to vaccinate now, but after she's pregnant, we're going to get her vaccinated if she's not immune. Routine urine culture for asymptomatic UTIs. We'll talk more about that later. HIV and syphilis screening, hep B screening, chlamydia screening, PAP and HPV if she's not current, and then baseline urinalysis for proteinuria. It's the protein-creatinine ratio. 
We don't have to do all those dipsticks anymore for routine prenatal care. If we have a baseline protein-creatinine ratio that's normal, so that's new, that's very different than what we did when we were residents, um, so that's fair game for the board for prenatal care. Uh, then if she has risk factors, if she's got hypertension or we notice an elevated blood pressure in the office, that's not routine screening. We're checking those patients for proteinuria along the way. But one time baseline UA for protein creatinine ratio. All of these labs are optional. You know, the toxoplasmosis screen, mostly we just tell patients that now that you're pregnant, it's, you know, your husband or your partner's job to clean the kitty litter. Um, the hep, hep C screen in a higher risk patient, and then diabetes screening. We'll talk more about it. It's routinely done at 24 to 28 weeks, but if she is at higher risk, we might do that screening really at the initial intake. Cystic fibrosis I mentioned. Hemoglobin electrophoresis I'm going to mention because we used to all do that little sickle dex test to say, hey, does she have sickle uh, cell anemia? Nope, we need to do hemoglobin electrophoresis on these patients. So ACOG says hemoglobin electrophoresis, don't use the sickle dex anymore. Additional labs are done by trimester, diabetes screening, I already said, at around 28 weeks. CBC, we're repeating because remember the parasite, the parasite is taking her iron and might make her anemic, and so I have to make sure that that's not happening. I'm going to rescreen her for chlamydia if she is less than 25 years of age, and um, I'm going to rescreen her if I had to treat her. I test for cure in pregnancy if I had, to, uh, had a positive chlamydia and I treated her. And then third trimester uh, screening, syphilis, HIV, um, gonorrhea, hep B, if they're at high risk or state mandated. So in my state, we all have to do a syphilis test at 36 weeks because there was one case of syphilis recently in a newborn, okay? Seems like a little bit of overkill. Every low risk patient is getting rescreened, but my state is requiring it now. Um, group B strep testing around 35 to 36 weeks gestation. And then we see these women a lot, and we answer all those questions that they have about, you know, can I paint the baby's bedroom, and can I dye my hair, and, you know, can I take that trip to Arkansas, and things like that. You're having a lot of it. You get to know them very well. You get, you get a nice relationship of, uh, of uh, getting to really know the patient, and, you know, then you're... You, us as family doctors, we tend to deliver our own. So, you know, we have this beautiful relationship with a woman that we don't really get with other patients. We're not bringing anybody else in that frequently. At each visit, we're going to measure. We're going to see if the uterus sort of fits the picture of growth, check her weight, check her blood pressure, listen to the baby um, using a Doppler, and then at, talk about all those questions. The urine dipstick or for protein or glucose, only as medically warranted, no longer routine. RH sensitization, you know, this is that Rogam thing. Oh boy, it goes all the way back to medical school, right? If she's RH negative, we have to give her Rogam in certain situations, right? If we're doing invasive testing while she's pregnant, and we have to give it routinely, and Rogam is an antibody against the antibodies that she's forming against her fetal cells provided the baby is Rh positive. So you have an Rh negative mom, baby's Rh positive, there's always a little bit of sharing of blood, and then that baby or mom may develop antibodies against the Rh positive cells, and now what you're giving is an antibody against the antibody to absorb the antibodies so they cannot cross over and cause hemolytic disease. Um, unless you know the father to be Rh negative as well, that's not something we commonly know, but we'll talk a minute about some other testing that's now out there that allows us to actually know the Rh type of the baby in utero. So this, and here it comes, fetal chromosomal abnormalities, testing them and figuring it out prior to birth. ACOG says we should offer all women invasive testing, meaning uh, amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling, because that's the most sensitive and specific. It's the diagnostic test for a chromosomal abnormality. When you start describing these pictures, 
these, uh, these tests, that woman gets a look on her face and she's not interested for the most part. But you should offer it and note that it was declined. And then the optimal testing is described there versus CVS, chorionic villus sampling, and amniocentesis. The risk of fetal loss for this test is very low in skilled hands. Sometimes it's hard to find skilled hands these days because uh, fewer of these procedures are being done. And if she's Rh negative and one of these procedures is done, she gets Rogam. So here's another new test. So it's fair game for the board. It's nuchal translucency, that if you measure the, the skin, the thickness of the skin in the posterior fetal neck, and it's increased, it actually may be an indication that the baby could have Down syndrome or other chromosomal abnormalities. And this is, this is really week by week specific as to what the cutoffs are, so there's not one cutoff for that test. The test uh, that also can be done in, in the first trimester is maternal serum analytes. And what you're looking for is um, elevations of HCG or a decreased plasma protein A. This test is, can be performed about 19 to 13 weeks. And when you combine the two together, particularly with nuchal translucency, you get a pretty good detection rate for Down syndrome with a very few false positives. Okay, we're going to have false positives with mo most, much of this testing, and when you get a, a positive, they go on to a diagnostic testing. But these patients then need the alpha fetal protein test that we do in the second trimester for neural tube defects. The test that you guys remember was maybe called the old triple test. Well, then it became the quad test, okay? We added another serum uh, analyte to it, so that replaces the old triple screen, and that's very good. It increases the, dissection, or the detection of downs to about 85%. Um, and then we're going to use our ultrasound, and it's standard of care to do o routine OB ultrasounds between 18 and 22 weeks, looking for whether or not we have problems with the baby. The down detection rate is not great with that routine ultrasound, but other minor abnormalities may be apparent and need to be followed. And then there's this idea of you can do integrated screening, putting them all together, doing stepwise screening, and doing contingency screening. Not going to be on the general board, certain of that. But you, if you're taking the OB module, know about the different uh, ways in which you can screen this. So ACOG says offer everyone testing. A positive test requires a diagnostic test, meaning that you have to then go to amniocentesis. We'll talk about that. There's a little bit more to that. Especially uh, women who are at higher risk. And if you look at the risk, when she's young, her risk is like 1 in 1,200 if she's less than 25. And then by the time she's 30, it's closer to 1 in 500. But the time she's over 35 years of age, her risk of having a baby with Downs is now on the order of about 1 in 120, and it increases as she uh, ages. And so those women who are over 35 years of age, we really want to talk to them about down screening. And then cell-free DNA we'll talk about a little bit more, but if she totally declines amniocentesis for diagnosis, she can have a cell-free test. We'll talk about it. There's that integrated stuff. Oh, well, here it is. Okay, this is too cool. This is the neatest thing that's happened in OB in a long time. In mom's circulation, there are baby cells, right? That's how that whole RH thing becomes a problem. Well, those cells get lysed or they break apart, and the DNA is floating around in mom's cells or in mom's serum. So now if we draw some uh, serum, from mom, we draw some uh, blood from mom, we can send it off to the fancy labs, and the fancy labs are going to figure out, through magic, I guess, what is the DNA of the baby in there. All right, and they're going to amplify that, and then they're going to look for genetic defects on that DNA. Very, very cool stuff. And so the women who refuse an amniocentesis with the, pos with the positive traditional screens can be offered this test because very sensitive and specific, currently approved by ACOG only for high-risk populations,
because you'd still have an unacceptable number of false positives in this setting, but it also can be used to figure out what's the RH type of the baby, should you need to know that if hemolytic disease of the newborn or something like that is occurring. So it doesn't uh, test for the ventral uh, wall defects or neural tube defects, so you still need that alpha fetal protein. But cool stuff, stay tuned, may become the test that replaces everything else we've done. The price has come down from like $2,000 now to $300, and I think it's declining further. And it used to be that you couldn't use it for twins, but we do. So here's a question, routine prenatal care during her previous pregnancy, she tested positive for group B stress, baby had an uncomplicated prenatal course, what do you do? Well, I'm gonna answer this question for the sake of time. The reality is you retest her each pregnancy, unless she had a baby with a neural, or with group B strep illness. If the baby had group B strep illness, Every pregnancy is treated as though she's, she's group B positive. And the universal screening, it's a rectal vaginal swab. That's where the stuff hangs out. That's where you have to test for it. And if it's a positive culture, you're going to treat with antibiotics during labor. Um, the colonization rate is high, and you can't just clean it off your body. And we don't just treat them when the swab comes back positive. We treat them in labor. So what do we treat them with? You know, we treat them with... Um, ampicillin or um, penicillin if we can get it. So those, that summarizes what I was just kind of trying to emphasize there. And if we don't know her group B status when she comes into labor, we may have to actually um, provide group B uh, strep prophylaxis if she's uh, less than 37 weeks, been ruptured a long period of time, or develops a fever. The NAT test can actually be done in labor and delivery, so if that comes back positive, you can uh, treat her then. But not recommended if her, her screens are negative, if she has a positive prior group B strep screening but not an infected in infant, or if she's planning a C-section. Pen uh, G is the preferred drug, ampicillin is the second, and then there, there are other drugs we use if they're pen allergic. Antepartum testing, this is just testing to make sure the baby's okay on the inside if there are complications along the way. Because if there's something happening with the placenta, typically the amount of fluid decreases around the baby. The baby may uh, stop moving as vigorously, and then the baby may have uh, decelerations of the heart rate. So kick counts are the one that we use along the way. We talk to women early on, but a lot of times we're just sending them into labor and delivery to do antenatal testing. Non-stress testing is we hook the, uh, mo the monitor up to the baby, we're listening to the heartbeat, and we're listening for accelerations. And we want to see 15 by 15 in women that are um, over 32 weeks of gestation or 10 by 10. 10 beats above the baseline for 10 seconds if they're less than 32. Positive uh, test is very reassuring and very predictive of fetal safety. So you can just watch that test, that, that pregnancy longer. If it's not a good test, if you don't get that reactivity that you want to see, you have to do additional testing. And there's a lot of things that can cause abnormal, abnormal testing. So what do we do? What's our next test if they fail their NST, if their NST is not reactive, if we don't see those beautiful accelerations associated with fetal movement, then we do a biophysical profile, and we're looking for uh, fetal movements, tone, and the amount of amniotic fluid. Umbilical artery uh, Doppler is very, very useful if you've got a baby that's got intrauterine growth restriction. That will not be on the general board, but for the OB people, remember to think about Doppler studies if you're thinking about compromised flow to the um, baby.